All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar entitled Agile Testing Challenges, Overcoming Quality, Process, and Team Issues. We've got an all-star panel today, uh, including uh, Lisa Crispin, Bob Galen, Matt, Matt Hauser, and Steve Miller, yours truly. What we're going to cover today is we're really going to talk about Agile testing. We talk a lot about Agile development, but not a lot of attention gets uh, uh, laid out for Agile testing and the unique challenges that we face uh, as Agile teams. So we're going to first talk about uh, misconceptions that people have about Agile testing. We're going to look at the top Agile testing challenges. We're going to talk about maintaining quality uh, as we do sprints, and we know that sprints have a lot of speed. We're going to talk about establishing the whole team view. Uh, we're going to talk about best ways to use testing tools. And then any questions that you have during uh, the session today, we're going to try and get to as many as we can. So make sure you use that Q&A panel uh, to do that. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, make sure that you use the Q&A panel that comes with GoToWebinar to ask any questions. We're going to keep our eye on that panel, and in fact, if we start to get overwhelming number of, of responses within the Q&A panel, we may cut some of our uh, pre-planned questions short and go ahead and focus on the things that you really care about so that we can have some very lively discussions around that. Notice also that we're going to be sharing the event live. We're getting, using hashtag Agile testing for that. We'll also be conducting a follow-up session uh, at the same hashtag directly following the presentation today. Also, another thing, we're going to be recording today's session, and we'll be sending out the recorded session within 24 hours following the event. So make sure you keep an eye on your emails uh, for instructions on how to access the recording. My name is Steve Miller, and I wanted to welcome everybody today. I am the Vice President of ALM Solutions here at Smart Bear Software. I have a little over 26 years of experience in both software development, software architecture, and software testing. I am a graduate of the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and I have a Bachelor's of Science degree majoring in corporate finance and minoring in computer science. Now, one of the things that I'm asked a lot is, Steve, you know, what's uh, one of the, your favorite misconceptions about Agile and Agile testing? And uh, a lot of people think that because Agile is so lightweight, there's really no need to trace back your tests back to your user stories and requirements. And that's a, that's a big misconception because no matter what type of testing you do, you definitely want to, uh, to have, be able to go to a place where you can see that you have enough test coverage uh, to fully test all of the requirements and the user stories that are out there. So traceability, in my mind, really breeds transparency. And we all know that Agile is all about transparency. Now I'd like to introduce Lisa Crispin. Uh, Lisa is the co-author uh, with Janet Gregory of Agile Testing. and um, we're really fortunate to have uh, Lisa on board today. I uh, also wanted to let you know that we're also going to be giving 10 of her uh, uh, signed copies of her book away uh, today for people who attend today's webinar. So we're very fortunate that she's been gracious to provide that. Okay. Now, Lisa also enjoys sharing her experiences via writing. Uh, she presents a lot, she teaches a lot, and she participates in agile testing communities around the world. If you need to get in touch with Lisa, make sure you visit her website out at www.lisacrispin.com. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Lisa what her favorite misconception about Agile is. Go ahead, Lisa. Thanks, Steve. Uh, there, there are so many misconceptions, but my favorite is that people think Agile means faster, and possibly because we use terms such as sprint, which implies speed. Um, but I love Elizabeth Hendricks' definition of Agile. It means we deliver business value frequently at a sustainable pace. And in order to learn how to do that at a sustainable pace and keep our technical debt under control, we need a huge investment of time up front to learn all the practices and principles that go into allowing a team to work at the frequent iterations and keep their technical debt low so that they can work eventually it can work fast, but they, they, if you focus on speed, you're going to be in trouble. Focusing on quality does allow us to go fast, but it's a very long-term thing. 
All right, thank you, Lisa. Okay, I also wanted to, to introduce Bob Galen. Uh, Bob is an Agile coach. He's both a Scrum master as well as a Scrum product owner. And uh, he's been very active in the Agile Alliance as well as the Scrum Alliance. He also has a book entitled Scrum Product Ownership, Balancing Value from the Inside Out. You can also uh, reach Bob at bob at rgalen.com. Now, Bob, I'll ask you the same question. What are some of the misconceptions that you have about or that you've heard about that you'd like to bring light to regarding Agile testing? Well, there's a, there's a lot of them, uh, and thank you, Steve, for uh, inviting me in. As Lisa alluded to, there's, there's quite a few of them, so picking a favorite, and I don't even know if favorite misconception is the right terminology, but uh, one that comes to my mind is this notion that that agile testing is is a hundred percent a technology play or a technologist or a programming play and an automation play and that you simply throw things together uh, early on and you automate everything and you go home and you push a button you know before you leave at night you come in in the morning and magic happens and information flow happens and you use things like the the DDs A T D D D D D I almost feel like I'm stuttering sometimes but it, you, you put all of this alphabet soup together. And, and that's really important. Automation is, I think, an incredibly important part of, of agile testing, but it's not the, the only part. Uh, tooling is not the only part. Automation is not the only part. It's, it's factoring in the people, the testers, the brains. Uh, we were talking in our pre-meeting yesterday uh, about what the most important tool is that a tester can have, and, and I think Matt said the brain, and I, I want to amplify that. that it's much more complex than that. Automation plays a part, but I think good agile testing uh, requires like testing professionals to come in there and really be passionate about the craft of testing. So that's my favorite or lack of favorite misconception. Very good. Thank you, Bob. Okay, I also wanted to introduce Matt Hauser, and uh, he is a consultant and software tester, and he writes a lot as well. He writes for Software Test and Quality Assurance Magazine. He's also the lead editor on how to reduce the cost of software testing. He's also was the first Master of Ceremonies for the Great Lakes Software Excellent Conference back in 2006. And he's also currently a principal consultant at Exelon Development. Now, Matt, I'd also like to present that same question to you. What's your favorite misconception about Agile testing? Well, if I could build a little bit on what Bob was saying earlier, you know, on, on the one hand, we have this idea that's a, a kind of a dogmatic, um, we're going to implement, we're going to, we're going to boil the ocean and we're going to, to implement Agile, change the way we do business and exactly do it according to this book that we read, and we're going to do it right, which is a sort of non-flexible, non-responding to change way to, 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 to approach an Agile conversion. And the second, uh, I guess I'd say bad implementation, is sort of, well, we're going to tailor our approach. So we're going to do things. Uh, we're not quite going to do this, and we're not quite going to do that, and we're not. And you call it tailoring, and what you end up with is exactly what you did before, only you've inserted the word agile. So you get agile Gantt charts, and you get agile business requirements and agile testing is pretty much what you did before except now you have maybe iterations or maybe cards going across the wall and both those end up with comments like we tried agile and it didn't work and that's just it makes me sad all right we don't want you to be sad <laughs> okay okay so now what i'd like to do is i'd like to go ahead and have some some uh, frequently asked questions that we get a lot of times you know regarding agile and agile testing and just present these questions over to the panelists and then uh, have them uh, provide some input and some feedback based on their years of experience. Because we have a really rich set of uh, panelists today. They've had a lot of really great experiences and we want to make sure that we're able to tap their brain for what they think about this. Now, all of us have probably uh, at some time uh, participated in both Agile and Waterfall development and we are very sure that the testing needs of those two different methodologies is very different. The reason for it is uh, Agile is much uh, speedier. You have much lighter weight requirements. You're doing uh, continuous integration, so you're doing builds constantly. And that really does present a lot of uh, challenges for the Agile testing team because the, the whole way that you 
approach testing uh, really is kind of under fire, and it's much different than you can do it over in Waterfall when you have much longer time to plan things out, and you do it in more of a staged environment. So I'd first like to ask Matt, uh, what are some of the top Agile ta uh, testing challenges that you've come across, and, and how have you dealt with those? Well, I'll try to stick to testing, but um, to, to start with, and this applies to all, all types of Agile software development, right? I, I mentioned that double-edged sword earlier. And when you, when you want to start doing Agile development, you've got to go somewhere between this dogmatic implementation, boil the ocean, we're going to do everything according to the book. If you try that, usually in my experience, as soon as anything goes wrong, and it will because we're all human beings, the people that are opposed to the initiative will come out and say, aha, it didn't work. And then the second problem is uh, not changing enough. So the first thing is, what do we do first? And typically for testing, where I see that is, how do we shrink the duration of time it takes us to test the software to make sure that it's good enough to release? Of course, we can never be sure, but to have some confidence. That, that regression test window, I think um, the pop and ducks call this the cadence. From we want to start figuring out to, to, uh, when we can release this thing to let's put it out there. In a traditional shop, that might be weeks, and we might want to get that down to hours. Um, that's a significant challenge. And as soon as we say, OK, we're going to shrink that window, we can't stop developing software in order to do that. So now we have to sort of figure out how we're going to invest our time. Do I just get this darn release out, or do I then build some automation and some hooks and some investments to allow me to test faster? Uh, those are the top couple that come to mind. Okay, great, thank you. And Lisa, did you have anything to, to add to that? Because you know, um, we all know that it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose sometimes. Whenever you're doing agile testing, because <laughs> builds are coming continuously. You're 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 always having to test with you know with uh, code that has changed. How how do you address that? Well, building on what Matt said, I think one thing that's very hard to learn is how to slice features into small enough pieces so that you can work incrementally as well as iteratively and start with some simple vertical slice through a new piece of functionality or feature. Um, get that coded, tested, automated, everything that explored, everything that's needed, and then start building on that. Uh, it takes time to learn that, and so another key is building time to learn into your first several months or even your first couple years of work. Um, another challenge for larger companies is specialized testing. Perhaps only a few people out of out of 50 scrum teams know how to do performance and load testing or know how to do security testing or some specialty that's just not widely known. And how do you spread those people around? So lots of challenges that require a lot of experiments to try to solve. Thank you, Lisa. And then, Bob, to follow back up on this, too, we had somebody uh, graciously uh, put into the Q&A panel that uh, doing Agile is kind of like uh, modifying the plane uh, during your flight because basically you're, you're coming out with these small user stories, you're tweaking them as they go, and that has an impact on testing because you have to kind of um, get yourself uh, to a point where you can actually test those new changing requirements. So what are your thoughts on that, Bob? I mean, I, I mean that's fair. I think that question is valid, and Lisa was, and both Lisa and Matt were talking about it. I want to bump us up a level a bit and talk about agile testing one of the biggest challenges is it's not just about agile testing. So it's it's not just a test group problem or a tester problem. If a, if a company or an organization is going agile, then they're going agile organizationally. They're going there as a whole team. Uh, so, for example, you know, given that question, well, architectural decomposition is different. Uh, product composition, UX, is different in agile. So, from a whole team perspective, it's not just dump it on the testers and let them figure it out. Not that anyone was implying that, but it's, it's okay, the UX folks need to maybe incrementally change, and the architecture folks, and the development folks, and the BAs need to incrementally change how they do work, how they flow, how they collaborate with test 
in order for it to be effective. It's not an in a vacuum. It's not an it's not a across the walls sort of play. It's a it's a it's a whole team play. And I, I want to emphasize that I think a key challenge is that the organizational leadership needs to play a part in that. You don't just let the teams flounder and figure out how to be agile. I think leadership needs to understand that agile is not a speed play to to Lisa's point, that it can be a speed play, but that's not the intent. Uh, so leadership, and you need leadership awareness, you need leadership support, you need organizational leadership sort of guidance and understanding, I think, in order to be effective. And then they need to influence the entire organization, the development organization, the product development, the project managers, etc. Otherwise, you have these little groups that are struggling in and of themselves to, to deliver value. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, one of the other things that, that I was wondering about, uh, based on your years and years of experience and um, managing these uh, agile testing processes, have you identified any specific best practices or, or processes that, uh, that help you when it comes to quality and making sure that you can kind of keep up with the uh, speed of delivery of the sprints? Is there anything specifically that kind of stands out in your mind? Lisa, if you wouldn't mind taking that first, that would be great. Well, I think I think one key is not so much an agile testing process as just um, a team process in general. One of the most common problems I see with new team, new agile teams, is that they overcommit. They want to make the business people happy. They think they can get a lot of work done in a week or two weeks or however long, and they bring in too many stories, work on too many stories at the same time and they get to the end of the iteration and the testing's not finished or maybe this, the coding was not finished. Um, and so it's important to undercommit, take only a few stories, focus on finishing one story at a time, including all the testing activities, and limit your work in process. And so I think that is, that is really key. And um, I think once people get good at some of the agile practices, they still have trouble understanding the customer's requirements and specifications, and that's another uh, big problem. Like you may not have any technically bugs, but you didn't deliver exactly what the customers wanted. So I think things like the three amigos approach, where you get the developers, product owner, and tester together to discuss issues, uh, the whole team approach in general, working together, and doing some kind of specification by example or acceptance test driven development where we actually start by thinking about what we're going to test and then we start writing the code to make to make those tests pass and to uh, get examples of desired behavior and undesired behavior from the customers and translate those into tests that drive development. Okay, so it sounds like uh, prioritizing your user stores is really something that uh, we should wrap our head around because, as you said, no matter what type of development you're doing, whether it's waterfall or rad or agile, there's still a, just a, a certain number of hours in the day and we have to kind of prioritize things, so I can definitely see that. And I really like your, your idea about uh, you know, using UAT uh, to, build, to, to determine whether we're delivering the things that are really necess uh, necessary for the client to be successful, so I think that's uh, very good feedback. So Bob, uh, what uh, what do you have to uh, to add to this? Uh, the best practices and processes here. I mean, I was I was yelling uh, "Amen, Lisa" when she was talking because uh, about taking too much on. I think I think a lot of immature teams have different levels. Agile teams have and test groups and agile teams themselves have different levels of maturity. And I think one anti-pattern or one pattern I see in in young or immature agile teams is they. Well, they take way too much stuff on. Their hearts are in the right place, so they're not malicious, but it's, they're just taking way too much on. And then they struggle. The second thing that Lisa didn't say is they struggle asking for help uh, in the team and then outside of the team saying, whoa, we just, <laughs> we just took way too much on. And they may not trust that people can handle a request for help in the team. So team trust, uh, team buy-in, team cohesion uh, comes into play. But I, I do see that. As, as a problem. And then there's sort of, you're going for speed and you're not going for quality. And, and you want to flip that bit around. You want to go for, you know, the three amigos. You want to go for collaboration. I would rather a team delivered half of their commitment from a sprint and did it well than didn't admit that they were struggling or tried to overcommit and then sort of slapdash it together at the end. 
Now you do see that in a lot of teams because they get the they get the value proposition wrong. They get the intent proposition wrong, uh, and then just quickly they just have to throw that. They have they have to transition that. They have to flip that bit. Uh, as a coach, I often ask for half of what they think, so I take all of that pressure for speed away, and I'm like, I'll I'll, give, I'll take half your commitment if you do it well. Now figure out by reducing whip how can you do it. How can you do it the most effectively and efficiently as a team? And the team starts getting that muscle memory around sort of throughput and, and quality, and then and then they can take more on if if they choose to. Absolutely, I think that's really relevant because I think a lot of people have the the idea that you just you start doing agile and all the problems of software development goes away and all of the problems of uh, of testing goes away, and, and we all know that. You know, it's like anything else that you do. It takes maturity. It takes uh, you know people really honing their skills and the processes to to really get the most out of it. So, Matt, I'll, we'll follow up with you as well. I'd like to to get your input on this as well. Um, have you used any best practices or, or processes in the past that uh, have been more effective than others? So, um, I believe I belong to a community called the Context Driven School of Software Testing. And we actually censure the term best practice. We um, aren't allowed to use it in public. Um, people have been removed from the community for using that term uh, in my community. Not everybody belongs to it, and that's OK. This is agile, not context driven. Um, but I, I do think that practices can be better or worse in a given context. And there are a number of things that are generally good, which are generally helpful, especially in an agile context. So, so, for example, is the team actually really doing fair programming? Are we really having kickoff meetings before anybody writes any code to build a shared mental model of what the thing's going to do? Do we have real agreement on what the thing is going to do? To the point that when I do find a bug, and it's three quarters of the way into the development of that story, the developer says, yep, 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 that's right, that's a bug, we've got to fix it. Or do we fall into this trap of, well, there's no story test for that, so we've got to have a new story. And the product manager's going, no, it needs to go live Friday. It really needs to go live. <laughs> we can't, no. we don't want to have this sort of explosion of stories that were created because we didn't, we weren't all on the same page. And I think those are all um, really good things. And those are sort of the foundational aspects of the Agile context that I think we're sharing here today. Um, one yeah, more thing I'll be one, one more thing I'll, I'll mention um, is this sort of mentality, especially for a, a team that is new to this way of developing software, that, that velocity is king and we're going to make shortcuts to, to our master king velocity. And in the course, it doesn't take long. Usually within the same iteration, within the same month, certainly, you know, you, uh, you're you working overtime, you're making mistakes, and you're actually slowing yourself down. And you can feel the pain. even even in the short term, that approach you know, doesn't work. And getting that culture change to the point where people recognize that can take a little bit of work. One of uh, uh, an extended client a while back, they, they said that the technical team said, we don't have time to develop this automation to, to do this kind of, I think it was adopting unit testing. Within this sprint, we're not, we're not going to be able to do it. We're sorry. And the product owner said something like, I believe in the value of this practice. Write a story up for it, and I'll fund it, right? I mean, it's OK, because I know that's going to make you go faster later. And the team didn't believe it. It was, it was like um, they couldn't see it, and they didn't do it. And that, that, I think that mentality of cutting corners actually doesn't, certainly doesn't help you maintain the quality and could even hurt your speed of iterations. Great. And I promise I won't say best practices again within your organization. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, okay, so um, a couple of people have asked along the way if we're going to be recording somebody today's asked. session. And we are going to be uh, recording today's session, and it will be distributed to everybody. So I just wanted to make sure for those of you that joined it a little bit late uh, that you were aware of that. Okay. So we're having some really spirited discussions today about agile testing, um, and the panelists are kind enough to go through uh, based on their experiences, uh, one of the things that I think people struggle with is that uh, the Agile team makeup is very different than more of the waterfall type 
team makeup because it's a very collaborative uh, uh, event where everybody is working towards the same set of goals uh, with with smaller uh, feature sets and uh, you know and starting to do as much testing as they can as the the, the product develops. So it always brings up the, the question that I hear a lot, and that is, you know, how does the whole team work together uh, so that everybody's on the same page when it comes to quality uh, and the testing that needs to be done? And I've even had the question, should we be breaking it out so that we manage the, the development sprint separate from the testing sprint so that everybody's working on their own velocities, on their own burn downs, that kind of thing. So I wanted to get uh, feedback from the panel about how they've approached that in the past. And we'll start with Bob. Uh, no, don't break out development and, and testing, please. Wipe your... So, you two mistakes, Steve. One is, I knew you were in trouble when you said best practice. I, my heart went out to you. I'm like, yeah, that's probably the wrong thing to suggest. And no, we, we don't want to break things up. I, I think it's uh, Agile is about, a t about teams, not about um, functional silos and handoffs and things like that. And I think you need to get that in the DNA of the team. Um, I'll start just here. Some things come to mind. How do you... You know what? What signs do you look for? So, if you have a team versus not, uh, so one thing like an anti-pattern is in a, in a, in an inexperienced team. If you hear the term, why didn't why didn't test find that? Uh, meaning the function, the testers on an agile team. Well, you're not operating as a whole team. You're operating as silos. Uh, if you're in a sprint planning meeting. And developers are throwing, let's say, two-point two point estimates for a story, and testers are throwing 20-point uh, for, for testing a story, and the two points wins, not that winning is the option, then where is the right direction? Because development is driving over test. We're not listening to each other. We're not sort of digesting the complexity of the story. Then you're not operating as a whole team. And if developers don't willingly sort of pitch in to test because it's the right thing to do from a throughput perspective, from a team cohesion perspective, from a getting things done, getting stuff out the door point of view, when it, when it makes sense without, without mumbling or whatnot, then you don't have a whole team view. Now, the counterpoint is look for those things, try to establish them. I think they're incredibly crucial for the team getting, getting throughput. It's not velocity is not the, the, the point. It's, it's working together cohesively as a team, meeting the, you know, delivering high value and doing it well, delivering high quality as well. And the best way to do that is to operate as that team. I think leadership plays a really strong part in that. The conversations, every day, every minute, every conversation, you have, a, you have an opportunity to talk, to move from test to team, to move from testing or development or BAs or project management to team activity towards done. And I think you get there in baby steps and then really amplify the team in, in sprint reviews, in, just in every activity in the Agile team. And if, and if you're dogged about it, I think you get there. Yeah, absolutely. And this was, that was more rhetorical than anything about breaking that out. But I think a lot of people have the view that they should be breaking that out. And I wanted to make sure that we illuminated that today, that that's not the best approach. Uh, Matt, I wanted to uh, follow up with you as well and, and, and find out what types of things that you've done in the past when it comes to a team concept, you know, uh, how that's, uh, your team has worked together to, to try and uh, hold up the quality and the testing that's necessary within the Agile team. Well, there's a couple of things that occur to me. Um, one is to focus on throughput, which uh, by that I mean where are the bottlenecks and how can we make the system flow faster? As soon as you have a bottleneck, then everything's going to be slowed down to the speed of that bottleneck. Now, the classic response to that is to complain about the bottleneck, right? Those testers are slow. I'm going to go, I have nothing to do with this. I'm going to, I'm going to pull the next story because those, those testers are, are slow. Or, um, or those developers are slow. We've got three years of business requirements, and the stupid developers can't even get the darn thing. We just need to get them to work on the software. And when you think about that from a whole system approach, that's complaining about it doesn't speed anything up. And asking them to multitask by throwing more stuff into their inbox doesn't speed anything up either. So what we need to do when we find the bottleneck is isolate it and um, lift it up 
and figure out how we can make that, that, that for lack of a better term, resource go faster. Right? So if the test is slow, then we need to reshift responsibilities. For example, we might have uh, the developers, because what developers do is they like to code, writing the um, system level test automation. Um, so we can the testers can define it, but the developers can write it or contribute to it, or developers can write hooks into the code to make scripting it easier, whatever we can do. Shifting responsibilities around to, to even out uh, the, those bottlenecks will provide the maximum uh, throughput for the system. And I mean, that's straight out of, of, of lean manufacturing theory, and I think it's well grounded in what we actually do. It's not borrowed some, from some metaphor from um, some other way of building stuff. I find that when we do that, then when someone is a bottleneck, we have extra bandwidth because we're waiting for them. We ask, how can we help? And culturally, that can get reinforced from management on down. Thank you very much. It's funny somebody just uh, chimed in that you know finding bottlenecks is not about blaming, and that's that's the whole thing about transparency and agile is that. It's not a blame game. It really is a team concept to make sure that everybody's on the same page and, and uh, moving to the same deliverable. But it's kind of funny. Uh, you guys can't see this. Us as organizers of the webinar, uh, Lisa's in the background chatting over to me going, let me try this one. Let me, let me say something about this topic. She is absolutely chomping at the bit. So uh, Lisa, it's your turn. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I, I, I definitely agree with uh, what Matt and Bob said. but. I think that the whole team approach begins at the beginning, and, and as Bob has pointed out, you need to be a good leader, and it's important to get the team together to say, what is our commitment to quality? And that has to be meaningful. We don't want to make excuses later on to say, well, we, we had this commitment, but we run up against an obstacle, so we're going to not meet our commitment. In the case of my current team, um, we decided that our commitment was to write code that we would be proud to take home and put on, put on our refrigerators or give to our moms to deliver the best quality software that we possibly could. And when we run into problems, something might be hard to test or we don't understand something or we have an automation issue or whatever that problem is, we can't just throw up our hands and say, well, that's too hard and so we're going to let that slide. Um, and also because we have everybody on board the team, uh, uh, Bob mentioned earlier, you know, user experience designers, business analysts, DBAs, everybody involved in delivering software, and all the domain knowledge, investing time in learning our domain. This allows us to simple to push back on the business to help simplify the stories. And there's been some talk about velocity on the Twitter thread for this, and there's, I think there's way too much focus on velocity. But one way to improve your velocity, the way my team does it is that we think we understand the purpose of what the business people want, of the features that they want, and the business problems they're trying to solve. And then we think of simpler solutions. And we can do that because we have such a variety of skills on our team, on our whole team. And we can push back and say, well, how about if we did this? This does 90% of what you want, but it's half the cost. Would, you, would this be OK? All right, thank you very much. Now, one of the, the, uh, the common questions that I'm seeing coming through the, the, the Q&A panel right now really has to do with automation and uh, you know, what, uh, what are the best ways that you can use automated tools, especially because you're doing so much continuous integration, that kind of thing. Uh, so it would be good to, uh, to get the panel's ideas on you know, what they've done in the past from an automated perspective. And Bob, if you wouldn't mind leaving that discussion, it would be great because it's a, it's a common thing that I'm seeing popping up in the Q&A panel. So I'll use a, a current team that I'm interacting with uh, as an example. Um, one, they're going all in on automation. They're using a variety of tools, mostly open source tools. And what I what I find is they're in they're in the middle tier and they're just writing automated tests. And when I looked under the covers, they're writing automated tests over user stories that are incredibly ill defined. Like they don't have acceptance tests on the user stories and. They're just very ambiguous. So they're not focusing on the three amigos, as Lisa mentioned earlier. They're focusing on writing test code as quickly as humanly possible. So I think any, I want to I segue into the other 
to the other panelists, but I, I, I would like to make the point that art, don't lead with automation. Even though automation is vibrant and rich, and I've always invested in it, and it's always saved my butt at the end of the day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think leading with automation is the right thing. I think leading with collaboration, leading with well-defined, let's call them user stories, leading with discussion over simplification, coming a focus on writing good acceptance tests and good user stories, and getting that sort of under your belt, particularly if you're a new team, uh, and making sure that you have that not as a best practice, but you're good at it, and it works for you and your, and your team and your cross-functional organization. I would rather a team focus on that before they start writing code. And I just want to throw that out there, and, and, then, and then start writing code based on those user stories, based on that experience, based on the fact that you, you're collaborating well as a team. All right, uh, Matt. Just for the uh, for the record, I think I heard Bob say "best practice." <laughs> but uh, anyway, said, no, 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 no. I said, not as a. Oh no, I'm I'm ejected. All right, I'll hang up now, everyone. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to turn this uh, then over. I, I think you're on. Um, <laughs> What's that? Go ahead. I think I think you're allowed to use the term rhetorically the way Bob did. I also think that Bob, Bob isn't on the Excel spreadsheet of listed people who are publicly associated with context driven. So. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Bit of room there. Okay, so Lisa, um, based on your experience, uh, uh, you know, Bob was mentioning that you don't want to lead with with automated. I mean, it's it's not the the end all be all that's going to solve your testing problems uh, when it comes to agile, uh, but. You know, as as Bob mentioned, there's definitely a place for it. There, there definitely, uh, you know, you can definitely. It'll save your butt, as he said, in the end, uh, a lot of times. I wanted to see if you could kind of follow on uh, with you know your thoughts on automated testing uh, tools, and uh, also even uh, we, we were talking a little bit about you know user stories and defining those well, and making sure that we have enough meat in there that people can actually do the testing they need to do with without a lot of undue rework. So I'd like to get your, your comments on that. Well, I have a lot of uh, observations to share on that, but I wanted to check. I think Matt might want to have wanted to chime in on this last point we were talking about. Did you have something, Matt? OK, he's not coming on. So um, I think the key for success with automation test tools, luckily nowadays we have so many choices. There's so many great drivers and frameworks for testing at all levels of the application. And um, I think the key, though, is for the whole team to choose the tools together. And, and even more key, the mistake my team made um, was in first focusing on choosing the tool rather than focusing on what do we want our tests to look like? What's going to work with us in terms of um, the design of the test? Are we going to use some kind of given one then format, some kind of natural language? Do we need a tabular format? Um, things like that. Instead of first, and, and then pick a tool that does that for us, or pick a framework that does that for us. Uh, so too many people start the wrong way around. We, we're dazzled by all the tools out there, and we want to pick one. So first decide on your requirements for the tool and then pick the tool. And then the whole team needs to research that together and, and do small experiments to, to pick the tool. We recently needed a new framework and driver because we had some code that our existing GUI test tool could not test. And we didn't want to release code to production that doesn't have real regression tests. So we actually uh, have did some bake-offs for different tools or different frameworks. Uh, the first framework, we invested several weeks into it and then decided it really wasn't right for us. Some teams would be tempted to say, look, we did all this work, let's just push ahead. It's kind of the Vietnam syndrome. But we just said, okay, that didn't work, we're going to try something else. And if that one doesn't work, we're going to try something else because there are other alternatives. So I think experimentation is really key and getting the whole team, all those skills involved that you need to make the automation successful. That's really interesting. So what you're really suggesting is that you have kind of an iterative approach to tool selection. So that's, uh, I haven't heard anybody really mention it that way, but I thought that was very interesting. Matt, did you have anything, it uh, looks like you're, you've been chomping at the bit to get into this conversation as well. Um, uh, what do you have uh, about this? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, a um, couple of things. 
if you're a programmer, I think test-driven development, automated unit tests is the bee's knees. Um, but it's a blast. I, I think you, you end up going, I think, and I don't have empirical research behind this, but you get higher quality, and your time to market gets sped up once you know what you're doing. Of course, you have to actually know a little bit about testing theory and um, beyond overly simplistic ideas. But um, I think TD is great at the developer um, level. That's usually, at that point, not really a testing tool. It's really more of a software engineering tool. It helps you do things like drive out your design by using your code as a client first and isolate your components. Those aren't, like, when I talk about testing, I want to know if it works or not. The unit testing doesn't really tell me that at the high level, customer level. So that's a testing tool I, I almost always recommend if it fits with the kind of technologies the team is using. Um, when it comes to actually customer-facing tests, tests that the customer would understand and want to look at. Uh, I, for instance, I like to, I mentioned the kickoff earlier. We get the three amigos in the room and we figure out what this thing is going to do and we write down examples that the customer can understand about uh, when an order comes in and it's more than 30 days late, we'll, we'll set it up for it. The order came in, and it should have been 33 days ago, and and we can do that in Excel. And you can hand that to a test room. When he gets a bill, he can uh, go through those examples and say, yep, it passes. And you could be done at that point, and you could call that a win. If you want to take that and put it into a tool like Fitness or like Cucumber, there are entire families of these tools, and automate it. That's cool, too. Uh, I, right now, one of the teams I'm working with is using Fitness, which uh, for a, a .NET framework end-to-end -end or a Java framework, you can, you can get underneath the GUI and go into the sort of business logic and expose those business logic tests. And then your GUI test is just sort of, if you don't have a really complex GUI, okay, when I put these values in, do they go across the wire and go to this underlying business logic? I already tested it. When the values come back, are there the right values that come back? And it can speed up GUI testing, and then we've got this sort of regression test that we can run that runs under the GUI. Uh, I think that's a great tool. So I totally agree with Bob in that, in that um, it can be a mistake to overly focus on tools, but you, know, you asked the question, so there's my answer. Okay, and Matt, before we, I'm going to jump to the, the, the uh, people's questions that are a part of the webinar today, but uh, it'd be really cool if you'd share with the, with the team uh, what you told us yesterday when we were preparing for this, uh, when somebody at, a, at one of the conferences that you were attending asked you what your favorite tool was. I just thought that was uh, a really cool story that, you, that you, you told yesterday. If you wouldn't mind sharing that with the webinar participants, that'd be great. Well, I wasn't prepared, but uh, I'll try. So... <laughs> As, as, at a conference, um, I think in March this year, and this company was hiring um, contractors and consultants, part-time, remote kind of stuff, the kind of work that I would be really interested in. And uh, I went over to them at, at uh, between sessions and introduced myself. And the first question they asked was, what tools do you use? And I kind of knew the answers that they were looking for. They were Selenium, Cucumber, um, Quick Test Pro, Test Complete, right? And um, in context, I can see how that's a reasonable question. But as the first question to ask me, um, I, I think that they actually said we're a best practices shop as I was trying to <laughs> figure out my answer. So I said something like, uh, well, my brain, um, a pencil, a piece of paper, I just kind of looked at them. Um, and I think that was kind of like the litmus, litmus test uh, uh, quick answer that I could give, and, and, and maybe a litmus test for them, because they said thank you and kind of walked away. All right, appreciate that. That was a funny story that we were talking about yesterday. And uh, now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and turn it over. We have uh, a little less than 15, or about 15 minutes left.
So rather than go through some of these uh, questions that we had ahead of time, I think it would be a really good thing to go ahead and turn it over to the webinar participants. So definitely make sure that you utilize the Q&A panel over in GoToWebinar because we're going to uh, answer any, uh, you know, a few of the questions that come through. Uh, I'll just kind of spot some that I think would be interesting to the group, and I'll go ahead and present that. Uh, anybody on the panelists uh, that would like to accept these questions, <clears throat> you can either chat to me to let me know that you want to take it, or you can just speak up however you want to do that, because that is a best practice here. <laughs> okay. All right, so <clears throat> what we're going to do now is I'm going to, um, Mary had asked a question a little earlier uh, as we were going through some of this. She was said that her team works on providing complex business objects reports, and their biggest challenge that they're facing with today is, is data validation. And uh, you know, rather than functional security or performance testing, they're really uh, the bane of their existence right now has been data validation. And uh, Mary wanted to know if there's any suggestions on how to approach that type of testing. Um, we're not going to ask for best practices. We're just going to ask for approaches. And Matt, it looks like you said that you've got uh, a question there, so or an answer. So go ahead. Yeah. So. I want to make sure I understand the question correctly because I'm assuming that the database has the right data in it, but we are applying some business rules to that data. We're doing some sums and some averages and some transformations in, in the business objects platform, which is really code. Right? It's, it's really complex SQL-like stuff, or maybe we're using some, some, some dropping and dragging to, to create this query report thing, but it's code. And we want to know that the answers that it produces are correct. I think that's the question, right? Yep. And, and, and if that's the question, um, the first piece of advice I usually give is code it twice. So you give the same requirements to two different people, and you have them both implement this report. And then you run the report side by side, and you make sure that they're the same. Anywhere they're different is interesting. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's interesting. Um, one of those is obviously not right. And sometimes when these comp reports get very, very, very complex, you can do a little bit of simplification, like just give me a count of the number of rows that come back, or give me some checksums. Or you can make the second person's job a little bit easier. Um, Harry Robinson has done a lot of writing on model-driven, model-based testing approaches, and this is inside of a database where all you're trying to do is simulate a query, I think is one of the cheapest ways where you can do model, a model-based approach. And um, so that's where I'd start. OK. And are there any templates, uh, anything like that, that might help with data, data validation? I mean, we all know that if you're, you're dealing with dates, where we have to worry about the bounds of the dates, whether there's 30, 31 days in the month, you know, whether it's a leap year, that kind of thing. When we're dealing with numerics, you know, there's always standard tests that we want to make sure that we execute on numeric fields, depending on whether they're currency or integers or you know whatever. Uh, any uh, anybody else on on the panel that that may have had experience with that kind of data validation and and being able to follow through on on some of those things that might have been helpful? I mean, I don't have an answer there, but I'd like to flip flip the question around a little bit. We're talking about testing techniques, and those are all fair. But I want to quickly add that I would turn this around and make this the team's problem to solve. I would make it part of the doneness criteria for the stories that we have a data, data validation challenge or a problem. It probably is di it has different levels of complexity depending on the features and the functionality the team is trying to implement. I would make the business aware that data validation is hard, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost the team more time, potentially to test that well, and on a per story or a per use case basis or whatever, the, the team has to, so the testers, the question almost sounds like it's a test problem. So, so we need test techniques, and it is a testing problem, but make it the team's problem, and testers can contribute to that. But there's a, there's a heck of a lot of design for tests that the developers can do, probably to make data validation easier. So I just wanted to throw that out there, of flipping it into the team would be one of my reactions as well. OK, great. Now, Danny asked um, Yeah, and one of the things you can do with here. that. One of, Go ahead, Matt. If I could just add a little bit more on top of that. So one of the ways I've seen that manifest over time, for instance, with, with something like business objects, 
is that you start to get reusable libraries where you can say, give me the people that have eligibility between this date or insurance domain, for example, or, or tell me if this particular user ID is eligible on this date. And then instead of, instead of having to, to recreate that in SQL, which is just, ah, right, you get these sort of reusable functions over time. And, and you can get that when you have the developers and the business people in the room when you're planning how you're going to test it. If you do testing in isolation, the tester's probably not going to say, hey, maybe I could write a reusable framework. The like, testers don't say that. The developers do. So I totally agree that the whole team can help you get a better long-term solution. Absolutely. And I was kind of alluding to that earlier when I, that, on that follow-up, too, so thanks for bringing that up. And that really uh, dovetails into a, another question that, uh, that Danny has here. Uh, he wanted to know what the role of uh, agile testing from the developer role versus the QA role, because there seems like some uh, overlap there. And you know, how do you how do you make sure that the handoff is good? Because you know, with automated testing, it's it's almost like a lot of the, the automated testers are almost programmers, you know. And um, uh, and there's a little bit. And if you're doing test driven development, you know, a lot of that is you know it takes these development skills. So I guess Danny's question is, um, you know. How do we differentiate between the developer and the QA role? You know what the overlap is, and how do we we manage the handoff? Uh, so Lisa is absolutely chomping at the bit for this. So go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I heard Jeff Patton speak recently at the Mile High Agile Conference, and he he likes the term positions rather than roles, and he likened it to a sports team. For example, if you're playing football and you're the kicker and you just kicked off and the runner from the other team is about to go by you because everybody else missed him. You don't stop and say, well, I'm the kicker. It's not my role to tackle this person. So um, we all have to wear different hats at different times. And so we shouldn't get too hung up on whose role is it to do what. We all have to jump in and make that a team responsibility. And when I hear the word handoff, I, I cringe a little bit because hopefully we're collaborating. The, the testers are helping the developers write the acceptance tests up front and the test that guide development and, and working in small iterations of writing tests, writing code, doing testing, doing exploratory testing, writing more tests. Um, and that should be something that just goes on in tiny little iterations until the story's done and all the activities are finished. And on my team, because it's such a testing intensive application, though we have four developers and three testers, the developers often will take on testing task cards because we've got to get that story done. Uh, last, just last sprint, we were very busy with testing and one of the developers did all the manual testing for one of our stories and we had a mind map of proposed test cases to carry out, which he followed, and he also did a really great job of exploratory testing because he's had a lot of experience doing that in the past eight years. So it's, it's again, like we've been saying, making it a team problem, and we've got this testing to do. And in terms of overlap and unit tests, if people are talking about automated tests, they say, well, we don't want to repeat what the testing that the unit test did. And I don't really find that to be much of a problem. Unit testing is so different from testing at higher levels. If there's a tiny bit of overlap, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Great. And I, I'm laughing here because those of you that are attending the webinar can't really see the behind the scenes things. But um, Matt had mentioned uh, that, you know, that most likely Lisa would say that you don't hand off, you collaborate. And, no faster that he could type that, it was coming out of her mouth. So everybody over here was uh, dying laughing about that. All right, so I think we have, uh, we have about six more minutes left in the webinar today. Uh, we had a question I think is uh, going to be asked by a lot of different people, so I want to make sure we got to this question before we closed out today. Uh, and the question uh, comes from Rasa, and he says, do you have specific recommendations for remote teams? Because a lot of people are either... Uh, uh, have teams that are over in overseas, or they may even be in the U.S., but they're uh, you know, geographically dispersed from where you're at. So, do we have any uh, recommendations as a panel as to how we can better collaborate between the team members and uh, how we can work better geographically dispersed? So, uh, anybody that wants to take that, uh, feel free to to jump in. It sounds like Matt wants to take that. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so the last time I had one of those day job things, uh, I worked for a company called Social Text. Uh, we made software to enable massive collaboration and communication. And the entire engineering staff was completely massively physically distributed, by which I mean everybody worked wherever there was internet and power. So we had to figure out how to make remote work work because that's how we were structured. Now, the company mostly hired out of people who were uh, contributors to open source software, and that's how a lot of open source software is built because there are no physical offices. So there were a few techniques we used from there, um, like continuous uh, IRC, and we Skyped a lot, and um, we used a screen, GNU Screen as a screen sharing tool. So if you have a, if you have headphones on and you're in Skype and you have something like a new screen which is ASCII based, there's no GUI, it really feels like your prayer program, like you're right with the person. But everybody was remote, right? So it wasn't like there was one guy off in a corner um, who lived two hours away and only came in every couple of weeks and everybody else was on site. Everybody was remote. Everybody remote I think works. Everybody on site can work. It's when you try to just take a couple of people and you put them in a corner that you run into a problem because they don't see what's on the whiteboard. They don't pick up the back chatter in the hallway. They don't pick up the back chatter by um, the water cooler. And that's a, that's a problem. So with what most people say when they ask the question is, our company is grown by acquisition and we have an office in Belarus, Russia, and we have an office in Ireland, and we have an office in Boston, we have an office in, in Portland, and what are we going to do? And uh, for that, I highly recommend trying to have integrated product development teams in each space that actually own that they own that they own that can push to production by themselves. And then you manage the, the seams of the uh, components. You manage the seams of the components and how they interact. Not the devs are in one place and the testers are somewhere else and the business analysts are somewhere else. Um, I haven't particularly really genuinely seen that work well yet. Um, and also, one more thing I'd add is, is core office hours where everybody can talk together four hours a day, maybe 10 to 2 in your middle list time zone. Everybody's there. You've got to have at least some time where people can chat and some high bandwidth way they can do it, some kind of instant feedback mechanism, not I'm going to slide a business requirement under the door and see you in six months. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. So we're, we're nearing the top of the hour here. I wanted to just remind everybody that uh, we're going to be, you know, you can join us after the event on Twitter. Uh, hashtag Agile Testing is the uh, hashtag that you'll need. Uh, also, make sure you, you keep an eye on your inbox for uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, we're, we're, this is a, just a continuing series of webinars that we're doing here at Smart Bear. And we're really doing all of these to help uh, empower you and help you do your job better. Uh, and uh, we, we certainly appreciate you joining us today. We know that everybody's time is valuable, and we do appreciate uh, everybody joining today. Now, we got tons of questions today, uh, a lot of them that I couldn't even uh, address here because they're, just so, they're so numerous. We do plan to package these questions up and provide answers to these uh, over the next month. So. Keep an eye out for that as well uh, by going out to smartbear.com and uh, certainly keep your eye open for that. We'll be providing that. Now also remember that we also recorded today's session, so we'll also be sending to you the recorded session. Feel free to pass that along to others that weren't able to attend today, and uh, we certainly appreciate you joining today. And a special thanks to the panelists here, uh, both Bob, Lisa, and Matt. Uh, we had some very spirited discussions today, uh, and you guys are great presenters, and we do appreciate your time.